G'day there. You're watching the Aussie Boom Guru, and today I've got a quick tutorial to run a pretty hotly requested topic that people are asking about, and that is how do you handle multiple versions of Revit in your add-in? So the goal today is to consider the fact that the Revit API is constantly changing. There's gonna be new additions that are added to it in certain years, and also more importantly, things being deprecated, effectively removed or changed into something else. So how do we actually manage this if we want an add-in to span multiple versions of Revit? Well, it's not actually too hard thanks to the template that we're using. Uh, we'll run through how the template actually manages this for us, but then we'll show how to implement it as well. Um, so I'm gonna be building upon a toolbar we're constantly developing. If you need a copy, um, I'm sending each lesson as a folder into the YouTube C-sharp repo on my GitHub. Anyway, so why are things deprecating in the first place? How annoying, right? You know, we're trying to build an add-in and things are constantly changing on us. Now, most people that use Revit know that the version management, people don't really like it. The fact that you have to effectively have new versions every year and things change. Uh, but I guess with that comes the benefit of things improving and changing. So I'm not really gonna make this a topic complaining about that. This is more focusing on the fact that things do change and we're gonna to wanna to capture this in our code. Now it's important to understand Revit didn't always have an API available for developers like it does now. The people developing Revit are often working back and taking old parts of Revit where the API is not currently available and exposing it for us to access. So you're gonna have some things coming in because they just didn't exist in the first place. Um, and then there'll be other things that maybe weren't written in a way that's user friendly or set up for a modern software development ecosystem. So they're changing those as well. Or maybe they're gonna be modifying things to make them more compatible with things like the APS or Forge API. So for example, Forge type IDs. So here's some examples of things that changed or came in, uh, just a few of them, there's obviously a lot of them. Um, but for example, before Revit 2022, we couldn't create floors and we couldn't export PDFs using the API. We could print them, but we couldn't export them. As well as this, uh, Forge type IDs is something that has been progressively coming in year on year to the API and eventually things have actually become deprecated, such as parameter groups and specification types, those types of things, especially related to family parameters. Um, and the one that we'll be looking at today is the element IDs integer value, uh, which has been called in different ways in different versions, uh, particularly because in, uh, I think, 2024, uh, they made you call it with a 64-bit integer instead of a 32-bit one. So we're going to look at how we can handle that difference in an example. So we're going to achieve this using what are called preprocessor directives in C Sharp, where constants are checked on, uh, and you can actually literally blank out sections of your code so that they're not read or compiled, depending on your configuration, and in this case, the constants that it's using. So the constants are gonna be managed in this case by the nice point Revit template, luckily, um, but we'll show you how to implement this in your add-in. So we're gonna demonstrate, first of all, what an API deprecation looks like in the Red API docs. From there, we're gonna set up a method to account for this and also show you how you can check for constants and properties. And we're also gonna have a look at how this is managed behind the scenes in the nice point template for us. As well as this, we'll finally implement the preprocessor directive in a method to allow it to behave differently in different versions of Revit. Um, so let's just jump straight into the Revit API docs. So this is an example of a deprecation. We can see if we look at the integer value property of the element ID, we are clearly being told this property is deprecated in Revit 2024, and we will not be able to use it um, in future versions of Revit. So it's available in 2024 for the first time, and then come 2025, I believe integer value is probably just gone altogether. And we can see the API is now obsolete. So in this case, we can't actually access that property. And instead, we switch over to the value property, which we can see is now returning a different data type. In this case, a long or an integer 64, um, which is a different data type as well. So it's gonna modify the type of data that this call would provide back to us. So it's gonna make our code quite difficult to work with. So we're gonna have a look at setting up a method that's gonna allow us to work seamlessly between these two API uh, properties. This is all gonna be handled through the nice point revit.build.tasks package, which is included with the template, which actually generates for us constants on the fly. Um, so in this case, this whole uh, little piece of code behind the scenes is actually generating constants, depending on our debug or release configuration that we're using in C Sharp in Visual Studio. And we do have a pretty good explanation available here on how it works on the GitHub, if you're interested in reading about it. But in this case, we're gonna have access to defined constants of the version itself. We're gonna have the version or greater, um, and we have them for different numbered builds as well. And they're all generally coming from this property 
that we're setting inside of the, uh, I think it's inside the add-in CS Proj file, which we can have a look at in Visual Studio. Um, so let's just jump into Visual Studio. Um, so I'll just jump in. So in this case, um, I'm actually looking behind the scenes at the readme for the revit.build.tasks as well, which also explains this. Um, but if we just, in this case, maybe just pull that back and I'll jump into my Guru um, CS Proj file. In this case, we can see that we are defining a Revit version in a property group, depending on our configuration. And these enable the creation of constants that we can check for through the build.tasks uh, library or package. Um, we can also check for things like the framework that's available. That's also a constant that's generated, but in this case, we're mainly gonna be focusing on versions. So let's just create a new extension method for element IDs. And this method is going to return the integer value of an element ID. I'm currently targeting debug 23. So let's just make it public static int is the return type. And we're gonna say ext integer value, this element ID. Now I can say return uh, element ID dot integer value but where's value? So in this case, we don't actually have access to the value property. Um, now I can say integer value and say cool, but if I switch over to say debug 25, then we should run into potentially an issue. I'm not sure if the property is no longer going to be available. It's not, there we go. Um, so we can see the property is obsolete and we would not be able to build and run this code. Um, of course I can go, well, I know that now I have the value property available. Um, but then if I go back to say 2023, then we're going to run into the same problem. This property doesn't actually exist yet in the API for Revit 2023. Oh no, what do we do? So in this case, we're going to call on preprocessor the directives to solve this problem. So first of all, I'm just going to check if element ID is invalid first. So I'm going to say if element ID is null or invalid, then in this case, I'm going to return the integer of negative one, which is effectively an invalid element ID. Now we're going to set up two pathways. One is going to be for 2024 or higher, and one is going to be lower than 2024. Now it's up to you whether you want to specify all the versions that you'd like the behavior to apply to, or take advantage of the or greater um, constant that is also available thanks to the build.tasks uh, library. Um, but in this case, what I'm going to first do is focus on the lower than 2023 uh, pathway. And this one is very easy. It's return element ID dot integer value. And then the other pathway, which we're going to want to support is going to be to return the integer. So we're casting this and it's going to be the element ID dot value. Now that's not going to be integer value. It's going to be value. So currently these actually aren't going to work. Now, if I jump over to say 2025, then this one will start working and this one won't work. So what we need to do is set up a preprocessor directive. So if I type in a hashtag, we have available some pretty recognizable things like if, which we're going to use in this case. So I'm going to say if Revit 2020, we'll say 2024, whoops or Revit 2025 or Revit 2026, then this is what we want to run. Otherwise, else. And then finally, end if. And what this creates is different pathways of code that trigger when those constants become available. So I can see currently I'm in, I believe 2025. If I go back to 2023, Notice the other pathway becomes available and the preprocessor directive that catches those constants before we build and effectively locks away parts of the code to behave differently. So we can end up with two returns and only one of them is available in certain scenarios. And now we have code that will work in both the previous and the higher build as well. And you can implement these effectively anywhere in your code. You can add buttons or not add buttons to pull downs. Say there's a tool that's not really working before a certain Revit version, just don't add its button. Um, you will of course have to go to places where you use the deprecated API or the new API and add preprocessor pre directives as well. Um, but effectively this is how you can modify code behavior. So if I wanna just clean up this code and just get rid of these new lines, they do tend to have a habit of dropping all the way over to the edge. You can tab them 
But generally, if you do any modification of the code later, it's going to pull that all the way back to the left as well. But this means we still have access to this method on the element ID, no matter which Revit version we're using, but its behavior is going to change depending on the debug or the release build that we're targeting, which will generate related constants. I can also, in this case, take advantage of the Revit 2024 or greater, um, rather than specifying each build explicitly, um, or I could alternatively swap around these lines and specify all the lower builds that I wanna support. So I could say, if Revit 2021, 22, 23, do this, otherwise do that. That's sometimes a better way to go because that way you're specifying all the builds that used to work that way and any future builds from there are just gonna work the way you need them to. Uh, that's, that's one option. So for example, I can just effectively invert these and then I can explicitly say Revit 2021 or Revit 2022 or Revit 2023 and end up with effectively the same outcome, but I don't have to keep adding extra extras after. If I say support Revit 2027, I don't have to worry because it's probably not gonna have changed. Um, so that is generally how I prefer to work. I specify the lower ones if it's a an older API or it's something that was missing, um, but it's up to you. Whatever you think works and suits your development systems. Uh, but in this case, notice they also sort of drop back to, to the side, like I said they would. Um, but that's effectively it. Just a very quick tutorial today, but a powerful technique that you can apply pretty much anywhere you need it when building a project using the nice point Revit template. So a really great feature and thanks again to the developer for providing it. Um, so that's pretty much it. I do use preprocessor directives in my main toolbar in a lot of places um, and some that we'll cover later in this series. So feel free to check it out if you want to see more examples of how to apply this technique. Um, I hope you found this useful and if you like what you saw, feel free to like, comment, share and subscribe uh, and you can reach me at the email below and I look forward to seeing you in future similar videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.